So we talked a bit about what it means to have knowledge of God, because chapter 9 was going to help us to know God. And then we talked about a very important idea that comes from Gurudev's teaching too very often, and that is what knowledge is. And we talked about the difference between knowledge as information, knowledge as facts, and knowledge as feeling. So we can know everything about someone, how high, how wide, color of eyes, color of hair, color of skin. We can have all the facts about someone. And a scientist would say, ah, now I know this people, this person. And actually in in the age of data collection, this is very much how we know people. We know people by the numbers about them. But Bhagavad Gita is telling us that we don't know people by numbers. We don't know them by their information. And we only come to know them when when we look uh, for the loving relation with them. When we say, what is it that relates us to these people? What is the heart that I, that links to my heart? What are the feelings that link to my feelings? And when we understand these internal loving relations, then we begin to know. Then we begin to know. So the, um, the ambition to know God, which is everyone's ambition, cannot be fulfilled by reading all the books or studying all the history or all the facts. It can only be done by making a relationship with God, by having your heart, my heart, talk with God's heart. And what is the energy of God's heart? Radharani. The energy of love in Krishna is Radharani. So by establishing a relationship with God through our hearts, a devotional relationship, one of love, then we're channeling the energy of Radha. And once again, wherever there is a relation, there is Radha. Wherever there's a relation, there's Radha. Any relation. A relation with your with your husband, a relation with your child, a, hus- a relation with someone you just bump into on the street and and say hello and smile. Radha's there connecting you. And every time you every time you focus your attention on that moment, that spark of divine love, that tiny, tiny little particle of divine love in the bus driver <laughs> or the policeman or whoever it is, then you are serving Radharani. Then you are at one small step in Manjari Bhav. All you need to do is focus your attention on it. Bring your mind to that love, and you will be honest on the way to Manjari Bhav and to the service of Radharani. And then finally, in, in verse 2 of chapter 10, um, we talked about who can know Krishna. And we use the same kind of thinking that we can only know Krishna by having a relation, a devotional relation, a loving relation. And that this is only possible through prema, through divine love, through Aradharan. And this is why we call God Bhagavan in Bhagavad Gita. That's why it's not, I joked before, it's not Brahmat Gita, it's Bhagavad Gita. It's not, it's not the impersonal, the song of impersonal God. It's the song of the personal God, Bhagavad Gita. So it's a personality. It's one with whom we have love, loving relation. And that is our virtue. That is our, that is our enormous fortune as bhaktas, that we have this secret. We understand this secret through the help and the mercy of our, our guru. We understand that we are in a loving relation with God and not with a, some sort of external relation with God. <laughs> and there was discussion about impersonalism and personalism. I, I won't repeat. But what was really beautiful about the personal God, and even personality in a way, is is the, um, the mystery of it. We cannot know it. If your personality were to me a fact, then love would be impossible. But your personality is not a fact. It's an experience of a hundred different feelings and a thousand different perceptions and a million different sensual uh, experiences. 
you are a personality, a loving personality, and God is a loving personality because of this mystery. We cannot put it in a book. Your personality doesn't belong in a book. We can only realize it by applying it in loving relations. This is the best we can do to know God and to know ourselves. It's to do service, do devotional service, to use that love, to apply it, to do seva, to do any any number of things would put us in, put us in contact with with God. So that's how we come to know a personality. It's not by knowing the facts about the person or about God. It's by, about having a loving relation with that, with the person or with God. So I, I, to conclude, I, I always, I always emphasize, and I don't know if I'm right or I'm, I'm very uh, inexperienced, as you know. I don't know if I'm right, but I feel so strongly that everything we learn and read in the Viraj Lila and we learn in Bhagavad Gita should be applied to our lives, to every. It's a model of super supreme love that can be applied to our love for our cat and and the love for our for the bus driver. Not not to speak of our lover or our child. Okay. Then we we continue with we continue with uh, let's see verse three. Um Yomam Ajam Anadimcha Veti Loka Meheshvaram Asamudha. Sa Martiesu Sarva Papai Pramochate. He who knows me as the unborn, as the beginningless, as the Supreme Lord of all the worlds, he or she, undiluted among men, is freed from all sins. It's a magnificent verse. He or she who knows me as the unborn, as the beginningless, as the supreme lord of all the worlds, he or she undeluded among men is freed from all sins. So what's very important about this verse, I'm sure you're thinking about it with me, it's about knowing, about clarity. And once we know God, then that's all. Then we're free. Once we know God, then we are free. But then, so very important to go back and ask again. I just talked about it, but here we have it again, this theme. What does it mean to know God? What does it mean to know? And how can I know God to become free? He who knows me is free, undiluted, so clear and no lies and no self lyings with sincerity and honesty. It's not, of course, We've said it before, and Gurudev says it often. It's not about knowing philosophically. It's not about information or facts or data. These are all very complicated, actually. It's a much more simple kind of knowledge. It's knowing the heart. This is the first question. This is the first question of the universe. What is in God's heart? What does God feel? And that's why it becomes the question for what is in my God brother's heart? What is in my wife's heart? What is in my child's heart? What is in my bus driver's heart? We start with the question, what is in God's heart? And we know from Viraj Lila, from Radha Rasa Sujaniti and Velapa Kusmanjari, we know that there's an eternal love affair going on in the heart of God. A beautiful, detailed, subtle, fragrant, colorful, seductive, emotional love affair. So by reading these books and others, we can know what God's heart looks like, what the love in God's heart is, is doing. And then we can know what our hearts are modeled after, because we are part and parcel of God. And so our hearts are part and parcel, part and parcel of God's heart. So when we read Vilapakus Manjari, we're starting to know slowly, slowly what it looks like inside our own hearts. Because this Leela is happening in us. These Leelas, these beautiful, that describe so precisely the moods and the feelings. These are descriptions of God's heart. And that God's, that God's heart is 
reflected, reflected in a tiny little bit in our hearts. Our job is to make that grow, to make our, to clean our hearts so they can be as pure as God's heart. And we can fully experience this, this, uh, this, this loving, this loving and be part of the, and be part of the Vrajlila. The more we clean our hearts, dust it off and polish it, take away all the rubbish from our lives that distracts us from, from, from our own hearts, the closer we will come to God because the more we will be close to the God in us and the more we'll understand you know, the, the love, the heart of God. So it's to learn about God's love, we have to learn about ourselves. This is why we do our meditations. This is why we do our practice. It's to go deeper under the surface of who we think we are, to, to try to kick away all our ego, to not be fixed on our bodies, not be fixed on our our grumbling stomach or our desires. If we see through these things, then we can come closer to our heart, the heart that God gave us. So what is it? It's about it's about being close, isn't it? The way I can clean my heart is by being close to others. And, and what does being close mean? It doesn't mean being close in a room or no, it doesn't mean being close in a club or, or a business meeting or a society. It's, it, it means being close spiritually. Looking in your soul, opening my soul so you can look in mine and doing this with everyone we meet. Seeing in the other not a body, but a soul. Seeing in the other not the material desires, which I know we all have when I'm looking at my bus driver. Right? I know he wants to make more money. He wants a bigger house. He wants a, he wants a, he wants a bigger car. That's fine. But if I see past that, then I can see his soul. Because everyone, even the most material of us, has a soul hiding behind, waiting to be mm, uncovered. And that's what shapes everything that's important in our, in our relations. Nope. Somebody needs to mute there. I'll mute you. So, yes, it's difficult to be, uh, let's say, married when there's not enough money or not enough time and everybody's tired and the children are sick and the house needs cleaning. But these problems are problems because they cover the, the soul. And once the soul is uncovered, the material covering on the soul is taken away, then the children being sick and the house needing, needing cleaning will, will, will solve itself. So we don't pretend that we don't have daily problems. We try to see the spiritual in them. That's the difference. And when we know our soul, then being a husband or a parent or a boss will find peace and, and meaning. Okay, sorry, I'm talking too much there, but um, here's what Prabhupada says about this verse. Maybe I'll even read it one more time. It's so lovely. So Bhagavad Gita says, verse 10.3, He who knows me as the unborn, as the beginningless, so as a soul, as the supreme Lord of all the worlds, he undiluted among men is freed from all sins. Then Prabhupada says, as stated in the seventh chapter, those who are trying to elevate themselves to the platform of spiritual realization are not ordinary men. They are superior to millions and millions of ordinary men who have no knowledge of spiritual relation, realization. But out of those actually trying to understand their spiritual situation, one who can come to the understanding that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the proprietor of everything, the unborn, so eternal, that one is the most successful spiritually realized person. In that stage only, says Prabhupada, when one has fully understood Krishna's supreme position, can one be free completely from all sinful reactions. 
It's also a very nice text from Prabhupada there. It talks about the same themes, about, about truly knowing, about what knowledge is. And here Prabhupada takes up Gurudev's point that knowledge is not about information, but it's about spirit, about spiritual realization. And it also talks about um, what realization is, which is simply realizing that we have a soul and that soul is made of loving devotion. I'm just reading Divya's uh, commentary on my cat and dogs. Thank you very much. <laughs> so our goal is this realization. You could say a double one, that we have a soul and that that soul is made of love, a loving relation. It's a heart. It's love. This was this is what Bhagavan means, this, this name of God. Bhagavan, this name of God means personality of God, a God made of love. A God with a heart and a soul and a self. And indeed, this beautiful Sanskrit word Atma means all those things. It means self, who I am, soul, what my spiritual identity is, and heart, what my loving purpose is. All these things for bhakti are in the word Atma. And realizing only that, these three points, that your Atma is that, those three things, you're already halfway to, to Radharani. You're already halfway down the path. And that's a bit what Prabhupada is saying. You are such a minority. You are already so special that you're sitting here, that we're talking about this. You're already so special that you've asked the right question. You're already so special that you understand the right answer, that you're well on the way, well on the way to spiritual realization. So if you just understand these words we're saying and the words that Prabhupada is writing, then you're already a realized soul. Maybe not 100% yet, but very realized already. You've understood something. You've understood that there's something to realize. You've understood that the question is inside you and not in the in your in your um in your material existence. There's a part of you that is hidden, that there's a part of you that's confidential, the loving part. You've already asked the question. So you're so, so fortunate that you've already asked the question. And right now, all of you in your minds are asking this question. It's the right question. And this question will change your life. You look at it sincerely, sincerely, sorry, sincerely. You look at it honestly, and it changes your life. Humbly, too. Sorry, I should add humbly. Humbly, you ask the question. And the answer will not come through the books. Books are very nice. I like to read books. It'll come through experiencing love, loving relations at all levels, from the famous bus driver now to the to your lover, to your god brother and god sister, to your guru. Um, Prabhupada then goes on. He says, "Hear the word ajam, yomam ajam anadim cha, means un- meaning unborn should not be confused with living entities." who are described in the second chapter as Ajam. The, the, the Lord is different from living entities who are taking birth and dying due to material attachment. So God never has this problem. God is never living and dying by material, by material attachment. God has no material attachment. Uh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada goes on then. The, um, the conditional souls are changing their bodies, but his body is not changeable. So our bodies grow old, grow strong, and then weak, and they grow thin and then thick, and finally they 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 disappear. They turn into dust. But Krishna's body doesn't do this. So when Prabhupada is telling us, explaining that when Bhagavad Gita says that God is unborn, it does not mean that he didn't have a material birth, didn't not have a material birth, um, but that he is eternal in a simple way. So his eternal potency, Prabhupada continues, is not under the inferior material energy. So his energy is not part of the material world, but it's always part of the superior energy, even when he's appearing in material uh, incarnation. Now you know the um, you know this philosophy, I'm sure the soul has no beginning or end. Your soul has li- has has lived forever but it has taken material form 
in different bodies. It has taken material existence. And as long as that soul remains attached to material existence, it will continue to be reborn. When we say that Krishna, Krishna is unborn, well, birth and death have no meaning for, for him. But when we say unborn in material way, then it does have a, a meaning for our bodies, but not for our souls. And the reason for this is very important because Krishna's existence is sustained by a divine energy, an internal potency. And the greatest internal potency, the basis of all potencies, is prema, divine love, Radharani. Radharani's loving energy is eternal. It's eternally supporting Krishna in his existence, in his activities, in his leelas. And even more important, <laughs> that loving energy is endless. Everything in the universe is finite. Everything in the universe is finite. The number of souls, there are only so many. The number of jivas. But all the material, the matter of the universe, it's finite. Vishnu breathes it out to create the universe, then breathes it in to annihilate the universe. It's all the same amount of matter. But one thing is infinite, and that is prema. Love increases. Love increases, and it increases itself. It comes from Radharani, it goes back to Radharani, and it becomes increased through loving relation. That's the clue. That's our clue. That's our point. The more we keep the loving relation of Radha Mohan moving, circulating, be, by being part of that circulation of love, by receiving love and giving love, the more we are increasing love in the universe. You see, Rambija, he is from Bulgaria. He give internet to us for the service. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Radhe, Radhe, Baya. He come only to listen to you. Radhe, Radhe, Baya. Radhe, Radhe, No, 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 Ah, uh, there you are, by no, uh, the way. for the. Dandavat, thank you for internet. Uh, no, please. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this uh, beautiful lecture. Mm -hmm. It's really, really inspiring to to get deep into into the subject, as you explained, and to move from theo theory to practice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is why Sadhu Maharaj is always uh, saying, uh, "Bhakti is love in action." Right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's beautiful and so clever about um, Gurudev is that uh, he already knew that uh, Bhagavad Gita is love in action. He knew this long ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, also so, good preacher on Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. so, Sadhu Maharaj is uh, inspiring. I, I think he's now inspiring thousands of people around the world mm. and uh, now every day we can see him uh, virtually and uh, I think actually if you if you meet you know thousand different philosophies but we will never find such beauty simplicity which touches directly the hearts no need of mental process, no need of uh, too much knowledge, <laughs> just directly the soul. Mm -hmm. This is our yeah. Sadhu Maharaj. Right. Sadhu Maharaj, say yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the best is uh, very much with the love and feeling to listen and be happy and cry. Mm -hmm. Because without melting our heart, we don't receive it. Mm. We have to melt our heart to 
to go in depth of the subject. Mm. Right? Right. Yeah. I'm very thankful to my Uddhavji. Great. He is so kind. After so many appointments and responsibility, he helped us. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, all of you, that you are ready to give your time for listening mm. and going deep in the subject. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Still, my voice is not clear, but I'm trying to improve myself. I hear you well, Guruji. Yeah. Thank you. Rade. Rade. Shall we stop here then for today? It's too early. I <laughs> <laughs> cannot stop you. Okay. We cannot leave you. We can we will die without you. <laughs> don't do this to don't kill us. <laughs> don't make don't us give suffer. pain to us. Mm. We cannot live without you. Right? Okay. We'll read a bit more here and see what Prabhupada tells us. Yeah. yeah. So he goes on, Prabhupada, and says, Krishna was existing yeah. before the creation, and he is different from his creation. And the reason he says this, Prabhupada, I think, is because Prema Shakti was also always existing. The loving energy, it precedes everything, and it governs, it governs everything. And govern, it even govern the creation, to govern the course of the universe. It's so fundamental. This devotional love is at the heart. So this is why we have to understand Krishna as Radha Mohan, as loving relation itself. And Prabhupada says, and then he talks about the demigods. He says the demigods were created within this material world. But as far as Krishna is concerned, oh. it is said that he is not created. Therefore, Krishna is different even from the great demigod, demigods like Brahma and Shiva. And because he's the creator of Brahma, Shiva, and all the other demigods, he is the supreme person of all the planets. So we know that the demigods are, are partially material. And so that means they don't which I say, they don't operate under the conditions of pure loving devotion. They cannot share the conditions of uh, perfect bhakti like Radhamohan do. They remain imperfectly realized and imperfectly evolved. Okay, Krishna, um, uh, Prabhupada then continues saying, Shri Krishna is therefore different from everyone that is created. And anyone who knows him as such immediately becomes liberated from all sinful reaction. One must be liberated from all sinful activities to be in the knowledge of the Supreme Lord. And then listen carefully, Prabhupada says, only by devotional service, only by devotional service can he be known, not by any other means, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. So it's black on white. What Gurudev teaches us, it's black on white from Prabhupada. Only by devotional service can God be known, and by no other means. And devotional service, because devotional service is where Radharani is playing. That's where Radharani is active. That's where Radharani is doing her loving relation. So again, the devotional service comes in trying to serve the serve, help, support the the the, the tasks of Radharani, making the love she wishes to spread easier to spread and to spread it ourselves for her. Our job as as manjaris is to do what Radharani does in the Raj forest leelas everywhere in the world, everywhere in our lives. I so add one thing also. 
Please. Yeah. That devotion is love in action. Damn. Love in action means when love is not talking, when he's acting. Hmm. And this love is Radhika. Yes. Jaiho. Jaiho. Love is nothing. The goddess of love is Radhika. When she is in action, that is devotion. Or we are in that action, that is my devotion. Hmm. So clear, so, Gurudev. So clear. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For some who don't know devotion, for them I am sharing Thank that you. love in action. Maybe they will not understand Radha, but love in action they will understand. Mm. And Krishna also needs love in action. Mm. And that action of divine love. Yes. Because we cannot do material love with him. It has to be pure and divine. Right? Right. Then so Radhika. To... Then Radhika appears. When our consciousness becomes pure, she appears to teach us. Radhe. Radhe, Radhe. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, don't say sorry, Gurudev. Thank you. Oh, you well, like that. <laughs> <laughs> I came out in action, so I, I said to make you happy. Yes, I will you. you. If you go in holidays, please don't do that. <laughs> Can you? Believe you want to go for holidays for one month. You are agree with this? All devotees like to do that? <coughs> that he go for holidays? No way, Rudy. Say me. Share. Say something. Say something. He can go to holidays for one month? Say in your uh, Japanese. Italian, every he knows every language. Share, yeah, no way. For me, no way. Write to him, no way. Thank you. <laughs> Radhe, Radhe. I told you. Budaji, don't yes. go holidays because we will miss you so much. Yes. <laughs> I told Guru Dev. <laughs> I talked Guru Dev yesterday and said I wasn't sure if I could go continue more and my God, so, um, this is too shocking. I would take a holiday, but he said, uh, I'll give it one more try and see. <laughs> yes. How many are joining? How many are joining now? Gurudev is asking. 57. My you God. All. You see? All, all, mm. all, all Zoom. You are very new in the Zoom classes. <laughs> And so many are joining to you. You imagine? Hmm. And one place, maybe 10 people are sitting. You don't know how much they are interested to listen to you. Hmm. You cannot do that. Okay. No holiday then, Gurudev, no holiday. They are crying to listen to your holidays. They are not. No yes. Way to we are crying when you go on holiday. <laughs> we cannot live without you. Really, it's it's, it's so amazing. The, the the readings and you are so individual, so lovely, and so helpingful for us for our stupid mind. It's so very very wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Such nice faces everywhere. Oh my God! You see. After a long time, she come, say something, speak in Dutch, no problem. Yeah. 
speak French. I, I, I have a well and a very silent, hidden devotion time. <laughs> But I I follow you and I'm I'm always when I can listen you sharing, I it's a vibration in my deepest insight. Mm. So um, really, you have a special mood to share the deepest nectar, which we are all together are longing for. So don't don't go in holiday, please. No. <laughs> Thank you so much, Udava. And all together. Thank you, Gurudev. Yeah, my Kundalata. Mm -hmm. Miss you. <laughs> miss you. I miss you. Are there some Japanese say who can talk English? Talk to Udava. Yeah. Uh, you are helping us to find the old loves in the Bhagavad Gita, which we didn't know that much. And in Gurudev, and you are the person to give us a chance to notice there's a soul love in the Bhagavad Gita. So don't leave that alone. Us. So you can be holding here in a Zoom, I think. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, please don't leave us. We all need you. All Japanese oh. devotees love you. Please don't leave us. Yes, be ready. <laughs> now I'm very embarrassed. No holiday, then. <laughs> I don't be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Utoa? <laughs> I think my holiday is cancelled, yes. <laughs> Rade Rade Udava, I just want also to say that we really love and yeah, we would miss you so much. And um, just take us where you go, you take us with <laughs> with you with you. Just if you go on holiday, we all go with you. <laughs> we just follow you. Rade Rade, lots of love. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't really a beach holiday. It was more like a stay in bed holiday. Oh. You see, Uddhava, this is love in action. Yeah. What you teach. Yeah. This is the mercy of Radhika you are giving to us. I see love in action in all these faces. You see, Gurudev, you just have your phone there, but there's so many faces smiling. They're so beautiful. My I God. Am. Melting. Melting me. I cry with uh, tears for every face I see. They're just beautiful, all of you. Thank you. And you see that it's so easy to see the love in you, my brothers and sisters. It's my so easy. It's right, you. it's right there on the edge, right on the surface. You, you don't have to it. go deep. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. This is all your great mercy. Thank you. Yeah. I will not interpret and yeah. disturb it. <laughs> that I want to share with them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Shia. Thank you, Radhe. Uh, Six thirty is the time. You cannot go out before. Uh, this is what happens when you call to Gurudev and you say I'm having doubts. You know, I went to Japan. My mm -hmm. habit to be one hour, one and a half hour giving classes in Europe. When I went to Japan, I say, how many hour class they like? They say, eight hours. <laughs> really? Yeah. I say, what? To Jananda, first time. What? Eight hours? And really, <laughs> they are listening eight hours. With pen and pen, copy and writing and recording everything. Oh my God. Very serious. Don't think they're, they're so just sincere, listening. the Japanese devotees. So great. Eight hours. Only one hour is lunch or it time. <laughs> no, at least there's food and it's not fasting too. Yeah. Yeah. So please give more. No. Yeah. How to uh, how to speak up to this? <laughs> hmm. Now let's start with what Gurudev just said about love in action. Uh -huh. No stopping. Go on. Yeah. What Gurudev said about love in action 
is that's such um that's really the lesson at the heart of all of what 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 we're saying. And Guru Dev has been saying it for twenty years. It's nothing that I'm inventing. It's but love in action means loving in your daily life. And like Guru Dev just said, not talking. Talking is okay, but thinking that talking is enough. No, it's giving love through your heart every day, every moment. Exactly this love I see in your eyes on all the little screens. So beautiful. It's so clear that you have it, and it's so close to your to your surface, to your eyes. Just open the little door, and your love is there. I can see it. There's no deep. You have to. It's no difficult for you. So Without that, Prabhu, I want to say you also that uh, it's so everything is so wonderful. I know Prabhupad maybe 25 years, but uh, by your interpretation, e- easy interpretation of of uh, Prabhupada's words, you are spreading the glories of Prabhupada and Guru there in a very mm. nice way. I'm I'm very happy that I know you. We don't mm. know each other, but I feel that we know him. We very will nice. meet one day, my dear. <laughs> you always have such nice commentaries in the chat. <laughs> hmm. Well, let's see what we were we talking about. Uh, the demigods, and then Krishna comes before everything. Oh, and then he said, "One must." This is Prabhupada talking now. One must be liberated from all sinful activities. And you remember Gurudev taught us about this too from uh, Mary Magdalena. That uh, the only sin she said was to forget that you have a soul, and what we can add to that maybe is the Gurudev as Guru Manjari Maya Mary Magdalena. The only sin is to forget you have a soul that is made of love, because Gurudev would never accept that it's just a soul in Gopi Bhav, but that the soul is made of loving devotion, and it shows itself through. Loving, loving, loving action, like we just said. So that's what Parvapad says too. Only by devotional service can Krishna be known and not by any other means, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. This is what Gurudev has always said, but only through loving relation. And that re- loving relation comes through your love in action, your everyday love in action. To I go back to your your bus driver, my favorite example now, or the person at Starbucks who's made uh, three hundred cups of coffee that morning, and you see her, and you buy your coffee, and you look into her eyes, and you see her love, and you see her soul, and you smile, and she sees yours. This is how love grows in the universe. We multiply it by. A hundred thousand Starbucks, and we're doing love in action by sharing our love every day with everyone, finding the divine in everyone's eyes, in everyone's actions, and it, and and acknowledging it, recognizing it. Um, what in French we say valorizing that, but making sure this person knows it's important, like. Guru Dev does for you. you. You know, everyone watching and listening here right now knows that your soul is important because Guru Dev tells you this and teaches you this. But the people in the world who don't have a wonderful Guru like we do, they also need to know that their soul is is divine and beautiful. And that, that is love in action. So we have to remember the soul. And then when we remember the soul, we have to remember that it's made of love. And we know that we will, we will, we will be realized when this is no longer a question. I had such a beautiful experience. Um, I, I went to Oslo two weeks ago to see my children. They live there. And we went to the museum. It was a beautiful new museum. And my children, they walked around and looked at the paintings. And I walked around and looked at the people. And all I could see was souls. All I could see was glowing, glowing souls, beautiful, all of them. The little ones crying, the old men angry, the the young men frustrated, and all I see were their beautiful souls inside, walking around the museum, being themselves, trying to be themselves. It was such an enlightening experience. 
And this is what I wish I could bring to every moment of my life. And I, what I what I ask you to bring to every moment of your life too. Remember the soul and remember that soul not only needs love, like we learn in psychology, but wants to give love. And this is the, the basic quality of a, a soul. That's the basic. Just like Krishna, just like Radha Mohan is made of love, every one of our souls is made of love. That's all that matters. And somehow we have to find a way to put that into action, love in action. That's what bhakti means. Bhakti means, like Gurudeva said, love in action. That means putting into action the love that's naturally in our heart. Completely naturally, right? It's not, okay, now I'm going to be a bhakta, so I need to go out and get some love from some somebody. No. Being a bhakta means uncovering the love in you and, and putting it into action to release the love into the world because it's not yours this love doesn't belong to you it belongs to Radharani it came to you by Guru Mercy by Prabhupada Mercy it came to you and it must flow out from you you didn't start it you're not the final station it has to go through you through your soul and on to another soul and on to another soul and I think the last time I described that as a nuclear reaction. The souls multiplying and the love going out everywhere and becoming greater and greater. <clears throat> and Prabhupada adds in one sentence, he says, one should not try to understand Krishna as a human being. Okay. Krishna is not a human being. That's pretty easy. But then, let's ask another question. What is a human being? Well, we know that a human being is something quite entangled in material existence. Car and house and job and clothes and food and pleasures. But you here know that a human being is um, a soul. And you also know that that soul is a heart. A heart and soul is a loving soul. And you also know... You see, I'm telling you only what you already know. I'm not, I'm not even a teacher. I just tell you what you already know. You also know that um, that your soul is part and parcel of the divine, of Radha Mohan. So everything that's happening in your heart, the feelings you feel, are linked to Radha Mohan. Their loving relation is linked to the loving, the aspiration for loving relation in your your heart. This is why I say again and again, get out of the way. I'm talking to your ego now. Ego, get out of the way of that soul. We have no need for you here. You're just a block. Please, we have love and action work to do. Get out of the way. So that's what a human being is. So when Prabhupada says, well, don't understand Krishna as a human being, let's not go too quickly because a human being is a little bit of Krishna. So the, and the degree to which we realize the love in our souls, that's the degree we, we resemble God, the, the degree to which we resemble Radha Mohan. Yeah. Let's see. So realizing the love in our hearts, that's already in our hearts, it's like uh, house cleaning. Dusting things off, polishes, polishing the heart, dusting the heart, uncovering the heart. And when we do this, only a little bit. That's what's so beautiful. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to have a little glimpse, a little grain. And we can see this in everything, this love in action. There, there are traces of it everywhere. We taste it in our food, right? Haven't you tasted a little bit of food, and it just takes you to another place, a, a wonderful dal or something. I made a dal yesterday. And there you're tasting a little bit of the divine. Or when we hear a song, and we have that special feeling, just a little tingle, then you're hearing the divine. And when, like I often say, you see in the eyes of a friend that special sparkle, then you know your own divinity. Or in a child's game, these are lovely examples the pure soul of a child, and you can see it much more clearly. 
Well, you see it, I don't know, in your, I think of Gorovani by his paintings and the, the, the love that shows in these. And when we read out loud, now you've all heard a computer read, haven't you? We have these reading programs. So have a computer read one page of a book you like, and then read it yourself. And the difference between the computer reading it and you reading it, that's your soul. The, the rhythm and the music, the breath, the emotion, the rise and fall, the interpretation, all that is coming not from the page, it's coming from your loving heart, which is coming from the Aradharani. It's a lovely experiment. Just read any text, any text, it doesn't matter. Read a cookbook and you'll feel the same thing. So Prabhupada continues now. Um, as stated previously, only a foolish person thinks him to be a human being. This is again expressed here in a in a different way. As him is Krishna. So only a foolish person thinks Krishna to be a human being. And of course, foolish people do that because Krishna incarnated and came to earth and he looks like a human being, but you have to be a fool to think he is. And Prabhupada continues, this is again expressed here in a different way. A man who is not foolish, who is intelligent enough to understand the constitutional position of the Godhead, is always free from all sinful reactions. So we remember we talked about fools a lot in chapter 9. There was a lot about fools. Fools are kind of beautiful, sad people. And what we learned, what we said in chapter 9 is, that a fool is not someone who gets the facts wrong. It's not someone who gets the information wrong. It's not someone who thinks the cinema will begin at uh, 10 o'clock when it begins at 9 o'clock. No, that's not a fool who's just wrong. A fool is someone who thinks that the question is about what time the cinema starts, that the question is about information instead of being about what's in our, what's in our hearts, what is in our souls. The fool thinks the question of the human is a question about the ego, about who's on the passport, about who's in the tax records, about who's uh, who's on the telephone number. That's what a fool thinks. Thinks that you are this identity, this ego. And someone who's not a fool thinks, I am this soul. So in Western philosophy, which I know a lot about, actually, what is a, what is a person? It's someone who says, I am me. I am me. And in bhakti or in Hinduism, this is an absolutely ridiculous thing to say. That I think that I, the person who's saying this word I, is the person I am. It's far from this. It's, it's the person I am is my soul. And the soul doesn't talk through my mouth. How does it talk? It talks through my heart. It talks through my love in action, as Gurudev just said. So whenever you say to someone, I am Uddhav, or I am, I am, uh, I don't know, anybody, then think again. Maybe think instead, I am a soul carried in the body of Uddhav, and this soul is made of love. Say something like, hello, I am love speaking to you. So we finish this first. Well, no, actually not. <laughs> We'll continue a little bit here. If Krishna is known as the son of Devaki, then how can he be unborn? So he had a mother. Then how can he be unborn, Prabhupada asks. That is also explained, he says, in Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's explained like this, says Prabhupada. When he appeared before Devaki and Vasudeva, he was not born as an ordinary child. So when he was born, biologically, he was not born as an ordinary child. He appeared in his original form, and then he transformed himself into an ordinary child. So he's saying that Krishna was born as Krishna, as God, and then transformed, changed himself to incarnate as a child, a regular, an ordinary child. And this is why then Prabhupada continues, anything done, under the direction of Krishna, is transcendental. It cannot be contaminated. 
by the material reactions, which may be auspicious or inauspicious. So in other words, what does this mean? Things done by things done under the direction of Krishna are not done from the position of material consciousness or material connections. Krishna is transcendental, and that means beyond material connections, beyond material energy. But what does transcendental mean? What is the transcendence of God, of Krishna? It's that he is made of more than opulent power. He is made of love. He is uh, powered by Radharani. That's what the, the transcendence transcendence of Bhagavan is. The transcendence of the Supreme Personality of God that is supported. What makes him special? That's what I'm trying to say. Sorry. I'm looking for my words. What makes him special is not his power, but his love. What makes him special is not his opulence, but Radharani who is living within him, with who's powering him. So to put it in other words, the direction <coughs> the direction of Krishna is the direction of Radha Mohan. It's what he does is done for love, done to feel love, done to know love, done from inside. So these are the two, these, these are the three reasons for Radha, Radha Mohan coming and Mahaprabhu appearing in Chaitanya Charitamrita. They're done for love, done to feel love, and done to, to know what it's like to love. All these things Krishna never knew, cannot know without Radharani. So Krishna has been venerated. This is the word. I wish I knew what Sanskrit word this translates, but we use the word venerated. It means respected and admired. Sometimes you might say it means love. But he's been loved for his power and beauty. And by the mercy of Mahaprabhu, now he's loved for his love. Now Krishna experiences and we experience the world as a lover, not as a king. So before... Hare Kishori! <laughs> Before Krishna lived like um, a rock star, everybody was in love with him. 50,000 girlfriends, 50 million girlfriends, everybody wanted Krishna. But he couldn't love them back. He couldn't see their faces. He couldn't have love with them. And with Mah Mahaprabhu, then this is possible. Prabhupada goes on and he says, the conception that there are things auspicious and inauspicious in the material world favorable or unfavorable, is more or less <coughs> a mental concoction, an invention of the mind, because there is nothing auspicious <laughs> in the material world. I forgot that I had forgotten this one. Don't think that uh, the appearance of Krishna is auspicious or inauspicious, because nothing in the material world is auspicious. It's all marginally auspicious or inauspicious. Because what does auspicious mean? It means where there is pure love, where there is love coming. Auspicious means that love will be flowing through it. A future of love is there. Love awaits. Mm -hmm. Mercy awaits. So the material world cannot be auspicious because it ends. But the spiritual world is endless because it's shaped around love. All things shaped by love are auspicious. Now Prabhupada goes on, everything is inauspicious, inauspicious, because the very material mask is inauspicious. So the mask we put on ourselves in the material world, the ego, the material covering of our soul. We simply imagine, says Prabhupada, we imagine it to be auspicious. Real auspiciousness he says, depends on activities in Krishna consciousness, in full devotion and service. So when I read, the, when Prabhupada says Krishna consciousness, then I think something about what I think about what Gurudev calls Staibhav, focus, perfect, established, direct focus on the spiritual nature of Radha Mohan. So people who are in that situation or, or that 
are that realized, they are in auspiciousness. Full, stable, solid devotion and service. And then Prabhupada says, therefore, if we all want our activities to be auspicious, then we should work under the directions of the Supreme Lord. Okay, good. And whose directions, under whose directions is the Supreme Lord working? Radharani's. Such directions are given in authoritative scriptures, such as Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, or from a bona fide spiritual master, because the spiritual master is the representative of the Supreme Lord. His direction is directly the direction of the Supreme Lord, and I add, which is directly the direction of, of Radha. Prabhupada continues, the spiritual master, saintly persons, and scriptures direct in the same way. So just like what we're doing by reading Bhagavad Gita, you can go back and read in Srimad Bhagavatam um, and in other classical texts. Sometimes we do this in our classes. We can go back and read and find the same message. And Prabhupada says there is no contradiction in these three sources. So spiritual master, saintly person, sadhus, and scriptures. They all are, have realized the, um, the loving nature, the divine loving nature of the soul. And they are then auspicious. And even if there are contra contradictions in these texts, and as you, you probably know, there are thousands and thousands of books talking about, arguing about arguing about the contradictions between shastras and what the sadhus say and what they do. And if there are contradictions, these are material in the material world. And in the spiritual world, there are no contradictions here. Prabhupada goes on, and then we'll finish this first, I think. All actions done under such direction are free from the reactions of pious or impious activities of this material world. A little bit repeating what I just tried to say, that what the what the guru and what the sadhus and what the scriptures are saying, they're free from this question of whether it's auspicious or un, un, inauspicious. They're free of this question whether it's impious or pious. It's just not a question. They're just living out the love. They're living out the they're living out the the, the, the purity of the of the soul. Prabhupada says the transcendental attitude of the devotees in the performance of activities is actually that of renunciation, and this is called sannyasa. Anyone acting under the direction of the Supreme Lord is actually a sannyasi and a yogi, and not the man or woman who has simply taken the dress of the sannyasi or a pseudo-yogi. This is something, this is a very important point that we talked about before, I think that the sannyasi in Prabhupada's eyes is not someone who has given up material relation to the world. A sannyasi is someone who's given up the idea that it's the world that matters, the material world that matters. And Gurudev tells this inspiring story about the day he became a sannyasi. Maybe he can, he'll tell it again, how it came across immediately to him as a system of rules. And after a couple of days in South America of being a sannyasi, he said, where is the love? It's the love I'm here for. It's not the rules. And, and this was this is very much what uh, Prabhupada is saying. It's not about denying living in a cave, leave, wearing your orange cloth. It's about being clear that it's the soul that matters and that the soul is made of loving devotion. So it's it's not renouncing the world, it's renouncing the ego, in a way. It's renouncing this idea that the ego is a master, and that the ego can do everything we need. And ironically, maybe we've talked about this before, ironically, when we're renouncing, we're not giving up our dependence, we're not sort of detaching from everything, cutting free, being free from the, the world, we're becoming dependent. I don't know if you still hear me. I just got a message that I'm signed out because somebody else signed in. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, 
but here I'll here I'll stop too. It's a it's a really really beautiful point. That's I mean both of these points Guru Dev has taught taught me taught me before. The one is that a, sanya, a true sannyasi doesn't renounce the world; he renounces the ego or she, and that what surrender what renouncing means is not being in, independent, but being dependent in a way to giving yourself completely to to Radha Mohan or to to Radha rather. Surrendering to the heart, giving everything to Radharani's heart, to Radharani's love. That is what surrender really is. It's giving away everything that would, all of what we understand is freedom in the material world, giving that up and saying, I become a servant of, of love. I become a servant of Radharani. That's what, that's what a, a bhakti sannyasi is. It's really, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thought. The idea in the West we have about independence, about free thinking and liberty, and the right to do anything we want, which in the end takes us just about nowhere because it keeps the idea alive that we are the architects of our life, that we're the boss. Once we give up this idea, which is already an illusion, then we're enlightened. Then we're realized. We give up the idea that we are the architects of our lives. Then we're surrendering to the heart. Then we're surrendering to, to Radharani. Oh, there, this is a very good place to stop, stop. I think the next verse is a very long one, and that would probably be better for, for next week's. And maybe there's some sharing or some other commentaries or questions. Adi Divya then gave me the Sanskrit for. Um, Auspicious, right? Samanati Karana. Thank you. Where is dear Ananda Prem? Is she still alive? She she, she fainted under translation uh, pressure? Eh, hey, bravo. You know how much I admire translators because they're putting love into the words. They're putting love into my words. I only imagine. I'm already feeling lots of love for you. But when Ananda Prem then translates my words, she puts more love in them. So the Japanese get twice as much love than I, I give. It's such a good arrangement. <laughs>